It's the 1980s, a time of some very interesting fashion choices, but more importantly from our perspective, a point in time where the personal computer starts to take off. Several computer manufacturers have already started to take off, with Apple in the States getting a good foothold into the educational market, CPM starting to dominate the business market, and in the UK there's the burgeoning home micro scene. While all this has been happening, one company has been sitting in the background watching this whole scene develop. The sleeping giant that is... I. B. M. At this point in time, IBM's primary business is that of mainframes, huge chunking great big computers that could fill an entire data center and use more electricity than a small housing estate. IBM has nearly 68% share of this market, making it one of the largest computer companies in the world. Some in IBM realize that the rise of the personal computer represents a threat to their business, and that many of their competitors are starting to work on their own machines. So in order for IBM to avoid missing out on this potentially lucrative market, IBM's managing director sets up a new business unit. This new business unit exists outside the normal IBM hierarchy and is allowed to do things in its own way. The sole focus of this new extremely well-funded business unit was to create a brand new personal computer, a personal computer they codenamed Chess. Normally when IBM created a new machine, they do everything from the silicon all the way through to the operating system. However, in the case of this new business unit, they were given one year to create their new personal computer, because IBM feared that they might lose out on the market if it took any longer than that. So the usual IBM way of doing things had to go out the window. This new machine would be built using entirely off-the-shelf components and software. For example, IBM picked Intel's 8088 processor as the core of their new machine. For an operating system, they selected Microsoft's DOS, after failing to come to arrangements with Digital Research to purchase CPM for the machine. The only part that was uniquely IBM's was the BIOS, the basic input-output system. The BIOS was the basic firmware to IBM's new machine, and was responsible for booting any operating systems, and sat as the glue logic between hardware and software. The very first computers seemed as big as houses and so mysterious that for most of us, the computer was behind a closed door. But IBM was thinking how to make the computer more useful. And as one good idea led to another, it began getting smaller, faster, less expensive, and easier to use. Today, a new IBM computer has reached a personal scale. A person can afford it. A person can put it anywhere, office, home, or school. And a person can learn to use it with ease. IBM made its personal computer to help a person be more productive, to help a person be more creative. And those are good reasons for a person to feel good. The IBM personal computer, now at selected stores across the country. IBM released their new machine on the 12th of August 1981, I don't think I'm giving away any spoilers here when I reveal that it was a success. Dealers loved IBM's new machine, especially the expandability of it via the ISA bus, which meant soon that lots of third-party manufacturers were making hardware cards for the new machine. The similarities between MS-DOS and CPM made porting applications from the CPM operating system pretty easy, meaning that many of CPM's most popular applications were soon available for the IBM PC, and new applications written explicitly for the PC were soon starting to displace those. The IBM Business PC also offered graphics, something that CPM previously couldn't do in a portable way. This meant that native applications for the PC started to make use of graphics. So, for example, Lotus 123, the platform's most popular spreadsheet, offered bar charts. I mean, look at this guy. Look how smug he is. He's singing to himself, ooh, bar charts. Mm. The IBM PC soon started to dominate the personal business computer market. They had pulled it off. Many in the industry thought IBM would never get a PC to market with one industry analyst quoted as saying, IBM bringing out a personal computer would be like teaching an elephant to tap dance. Well, that dude was wrong. Things were now all rosy in the IBM garden. A new potential computing space was now firmly where IBM wanted it. What could possibly go wrong? Meanwhile, somewhere in Texas, Rob Canyon, Jim Harris, and Bill Murtow had all quit their jobs at Texas Instruments to found a new startup called Compaq. Leaving a well-paid, secure job to found a new company can be considered brave at the best of times, but these guys must have had balls of brass because their plan was to buy an IBM PC, reverse engineer it, and start making their own. 
This could be considered the corporate equivalent of finding the biggest, angriest bear in the woods, saying unpleasant things about his mum, then booting it straight in the nuts whilst yelling, come on then, have a go if you think you're hard enough. IBM were not known for taking a warm and fluffy approach with competitors, and what with Compaq having just parked its tanks on IBM's front lawn, they were ready and waiting for IBM's lawyers to come a-calling. Search this place. We shall find our BIOS code, just like we did when we searched Eagle Computers. Uh, uh, look, we legitimately reverse engineered it, we didn't copy it, and this is starting to chafe. I can't help think that choking a subject is poor questioning technique. We shall find our code, for we are the IBM Legal Department. Tear these offices apart, find our BIOS source code. My name is Rod Canyon, and I am the president of Compact Computer Corporation of Houston. The mysterious company you have been invited to come and hear about today. This is an important day for us, a public introduction of a new personal computer that has been in development for nine months. And I thank you for being here to share it with us. I'll take a few minutes to explain the product and the company. Then we'd like to demonstrate the features that we feel make the product unique. The company is Compact Computer Corporation, and the product is the Compact Portable Computer. And we are pleased to have you here today to be among the first to see that the ideal has indeed been achieved. It is now my pleasure to show you the Compact Portable Computer, which we believe is a milestone in the personal computer field. In order to not get their asses sued off completely, Compaq had come up with a cunning strategy to avoid being sued by IBM for copyright violation. What they'd done is they'd split their development team into two. One team was to look at the IBM PC, see what its BIOS did, and write a specification for it. The second team's job was to write the BIOS code based on the specification developed by the first team. That way, they produced their code without ever having actually seen IBM's code. By the end of January 1982, the portable was on sale, and sell it did. In its first year of sales, Compaq sold over 53,000 PCs, which made for a sales total of over $111 million. That made them the first ever startup to hit over the 100 million mark that fast. It's portable. Portable? Yes, but Mr. Prince says big computers do more. Compact Plus does everything yours does, and more. Yes, but Mr. Prince says big computers store more. Compact Plus stores 30 times more than yours. Does it have a handle? Yes. Oh, drat! Compact Plus. It simply works better. Mr. Prince, something terrible's happened! So, let's get a look at this thing. The one you see in front of me is my Compact Portable. I bought it off someone I knew about six months ago as cosmetically fine but definitely not working. The first thing you probably noticed is that it doesn't look very portable by modern standards. Weighing in at a portly 22 pounds, it's not exactly light. In fact, carrying it for more than about 10 minutes really does result in quite a sore shoulder. Yes, that is the voice of personal experience talking. The portable really isn't that far off being essentially a desktop with a handle. Its frame by and large is made of metal with a plastic coating, and it's got a couple of ISO slots just like the original IBM desktop machine. It does of course have a built-in CRT monitor, which is available in green, green and green. As you can tell, Compaq didn't exactly set a priority on colour graphics, but at the time business users would have been used to using green screen monitors. Users of modern PCs might well be surprised to discover that this thing actually doesn't have a hard drive, just two floppy drives, one to boot DOS off and the other one to run an application off. But again, this would not have been too surprising to users of the time. Now let's talk about getting my one repaired. Its most significant fault was that one of the power rails to the ISA bus had unfortunately blown. So at some point an ISA card had drawn way too much power. Unfortunately this meant that the supply rail to the bus essentially acted as a fuse wire. So this meant there's a burnt out track on the board that I had to remove and replace. Unfortunately I did all that work before I thought, hey, let's make a video on this for YouTube. Um, so there's absolutely nothing to show you there, I'm afraid. If we zoomed in on the PCB, you just see a PCB that looks pretty much the same as it did when it was first made, because, you know, I fixed it. Yeah, it doesn't make for a great video that part, does it? So we'll move on to the keyboard. Um, pretty much every keyboard in every compact portable is dead by now. The reason for this is on every key there's a little spongy pan that's flexible plastic on one side and tin foil on the other. Unfortunately the foam material decays over time so it just becomes like a sticky residue, which means pretty much every keyboard dies. 
But hey, it's not like Compact were thinking, hmm, people might want to use this and make a video on it on something called the internet in 30 years' time. So perhaps they can be forgiven for their choice of materials. So, let's get our keyboard repaired then. First thing we've got to do is unscrew the case. Why it's only got six screws, we'll speed the footage up a little bit so you don't have to wait. Now the case is off, we'll unplug the cable. Next we have to unmount the PCB from the case. That's just held in by a few little screws. There we go, there's the keyboard's main PCB. Now we have to unscrew the keys from the PCB itself. And oh my god, did this take so long. There are so many screws. I mean, the thing's basically made of screw. I sped this footage up by 600% and it still feels like it's dragging. But eventually the ungodly quantity of screws were defeated and finally we had access to the PCB and the little sponge pads that live underneath each key. Now what doesn't show up well on the camera is the sheer amount of dead spongy crap that fell out the bottom of this thing when we opened it up. There was a surprisingly large amount of hoovering that needed doing once this was completed. Now we'll have to lever a sponge pad out from underneath each one of these keys. Now as you can see, the process of removing them kind of destroys them. The sponge that bonds the two halves together basically just collapses as you're taking it out. Now there's a heck of a lot of these, so I'll speed up the footage a little bit and truncate it somewhat to stop you all from getting bored. So you'll not die of shock to discover that it took ages to get these little things out and they pinged off absolutely everywhere, leaving bits of key just scattered around my kitchen. But I did eventually manage to remove all of them, which as you can see, just leaves a white plastic clip behind, ready for a new one to go into. While we got it open, we'll also give the PCB a bit of a wipe with an alcohol rub, help clean off any dirt. Now we're going to have to fit some replacement pads. Luckily for us, there's a company called Techlec in the States that still makes these things. They're a husband and wife team, and they also make up a number of 8-bit ISA cards, which we've also bought a few of as well for this thing. To be honest, I'm not exactly the best at fitting these things. However, I managed to do a good enough job that the keys actually work come the end of this thing. Of course, we now have to screw the stupid keyboard back together. Oh god, all those screws again. Oh. Now I'm into retro computing as much as the next person, assuming that the next person is really into retro computing, but I must admit even I draw the line at trying to boot a PC off 5.5 inch floppy disks. So we're going to install an 8-bit ISA IDE controller and a compact flash card so we have something to boot off and store all our games on. Now time for the moment of truth. We'll switch this thing on, see if it works, or if we have a difficult to explain house fire. And the good news is, it actually works. And after a small while, boots itself into MS-DOS. Which means we can now have a look at some games. Ooh. Now here we have the MS-DOS version of Ms. Pac-Man. You can tell it's Ms. Pac-Man because there's a little green bow in her little green hair on the little green ball. Now in some ways you might think a green CRT monitor does not lend itself overly well to gaming. And in some respects, you'd be right. But you haven't seen this thing in colour. CGA graphics are not exactly the nicest palette. I'll grab a little bit of footage in a moment or two of this being played on an emulator so you can see what it'd be like in CGA's default colour set. You'll also note the sound is not great. At this point PCs basically just have a bleeper speaker. That's why it's bleeping away like that because that's all it can do. There is just one bleeper speaker. That's, that's musically your lot. Now, okay, home computers at the time didn't exactly all have the best sound. I mean, this is not the only machine that just had a bleeper speaker. I mean, the Spectrum was the same, but a lot of home computers did have some form of sound chip, so it could manage something a little bit more sophisticated than the odd bleeper bloop. But these were built as business machines, not home gaming machines, so it wasn't exactly a priority for them. Next we'll move on to the MS-DOS port of Sega's classic, Zaxxon. This must have been ported to almost every platform back in the 80s. And to be honest, this is not a bad port of it. It holds up pretty well to the C64 version, and on a green screen doesn't look too bad. Now let's have a look at the classic that is Tetris. For those of you who thought this was a Game Boy exclusive, where were you in the 1980s? Yes, it was released for practically every platform, including MS-DOS. This particular version is a Terminate and Stay Resident version. Ooh. What that means is that you load it and it sits in the background, inactive, and you can mess around with DOS, and then for a key combination, launch Tetris anytime you like and then exit it again. Its clever nature, however, doesn't stop me sucking at it. 
Now, if you're thinking that sounds like a bit of a novelty, you'd be right. There were a lot of novelty versions of Tetris. The Amiga even had one that was there purely for copying floppy disks and giving you a game of Tetris whilst it did it. Now, just as proof to show that software kept getting developed for CGA and older PCs, we have a game that most people associate with the Amiga, Lemmings. Yes, it did not take long for Lemmings to get a PC port. It was released fairly shortly after the Amiga original, and supported most of the graphics formats for the PC at the time. CGA, the original colour graphics adapter, EGA, Tandy Graphics, and the modern VGA. Unfortunately, it takes quite a while to load on older machines. But load eventually it does, and we're treated to the familiar Lemmings menu screen, although in this case it's particularly green. Now I'd love to show you footage of me playing Lemmings, but there's one small problem. Lemmings needs a mouse, and what I don't have for this machine is a mouse. Or more importantly, what I don't have is the 25-pin to 9-pin serial port adapter that would allow me to use the old serial mouse I do have kicking around. But this creates a great opportunity for me to play a game using an emulator, so you can see what colour CGA graphics look like. Okay, shield your eyes everybody. Now if you've not seen CGA before, you'd be forgiven for thinking, why the hell did the developers choose those colours? I mean, ew. But the developers had no choice. These were the fixed four colours that CGA came with. Those of you familiar with CGA will be thinking, well it could sort of do more than that, via composite. It worked by putting two of the four colours next to each other, and because composite video would bleed one colour into the other, they'd sort of mix and you'd get a third colour from them. The thing is though, at the time, most people didn't have a composite monitor linked up to their CGA card for gaming, so most games didn't make that much use of it. But I do think it's pretty good that new MS-DOS games supported much older hardware. It's not like they shipped a special version for old machines, just the default floppy came with a version that worked on old graphics hardware and newer graphics hardware. Admittedly, the box art showed the shiniest version of the graphics done in VGA, even though it said that the minimum spec was CGA. But if I was the game's publisher, I wouldn't want to put my CGA artwork on the box for fear of putting off either the customers or inducing seizures in passers-by. For those of you who are still awake and have made it all the way to the end of this video, I feel like I've probably trespassed on your time enough. So I'll just quickly say thank you for watching, and if you enjoyed it, subscribe and I might make more of these things. If you hated it, destroy my sense of self-worth in the comment section below. Or alternatively, you could comment and tell us what your first PC was.